Uh, I will give a different talk. No formulae, no data, just words. Uh, systemic risk, microshocks, and banking regulation. So after the crisis, we all knew we have to worry about systemic risk and we need macroprudential regulation as the thing that's going to save us from the next crisis. And by now, this is routine. The European Systemic Risk Board observes systemic risk and assures us when things are right. The only question I have about is do we know what we're actually doing? What's the meaning of the word macroprudential? Of course, we need to ask a lawyer about that because it's a well-established legal term. It appears in the regulation establishing the European Systemic Risk Board. It's a major field of action for the ESRB. So surely the lawyers know what it means, and if they are, have doubts about that, they'll go to court, and the courts will determine what it means. A potpourri of measures listed in ESRB surveys and you'd be surprised how many measures there are. Well, when the term was first introduced by Andrew Crockett in 2000, he told the supervisors, don't worry, I'm not infringing on your turf. It's not microprudential. Ever since 2008, the supervisors say, it's not microprudential, therefore don't impinge on our turf. Is it what Spain did in the years after 2000? What we all should have been doing in the years before 2007? What exactly would that have been? It's wonderful how we can use a term in order to give ourselves the illusion that we know what we're talking about. <laughs> the same is true for systemic risk. A long time ago, systemic risk was the term that a supervisor would use when he ran out of other reasons for regulating banks. By now, it's also a well-established, I mean, they never did anything with it. Uh, it's a well-established legal term. Some economists think it's something to measure. Some, it's not clear what the measures actually do measure. Some economists believe it's something to tax. We're always so good at applying our uh, modes of thinking uh, to any problem that's given to us uh, without uh, knowing whether we really understand the problem. If you look at the use of the term systemic risk in actual discussions, you find that there are at least three different meanings. One, and that's the meaning that the standard politician attaches to it, risk from the financial system to the economy. This was used in the fall of 2008 in order to justify the spending of taxpayer money. We don't want the economy to take harm. Credit crunch. Japan, 92, Sweden, 92, and of course the global economy in 2008. Now, if you think about the financial system, you may also worry about risk to the financial system from the economy due to a macro shock. Like the SNLs in the early 80s, Sweden in 92, US or Germany in the Great Depression, and again, the US in 2006, 2007. Remember, the downturn in real estate markets began when the Fed began to raise interest rates. So there clearly was an interest rate shock uh, that triggered the whole thing. If you go to the earlier economics literature, you find systemic risk is the risk to the financial system from problems at individual institutions and from contagion. Now I submit that these are three different meanings. Which one of them have, have we been talking about in the past 10 years? Which one of them has the legislator been talking about? In my view, one of the key phenomena that we need to come to terms with when we think about the financial system is the fact 
that financial institutions tend to be exposed to macro shocks. And by macro shocks, I mean interest rate shocks, business cycle shocks, exchange rate shocks, real estate price shocks, and the like. Price shocks to prices that affect the entire economy, or at least a large part of the entire economy. One of the big puzzles, why are they so exposed? And incidentally, that's a difference between financial intermediaries and markets. If you ask the question, what happened in the burst of the bubble in the early 2000s, well, that was just market investors. Mr. 401k has to spend 10 more years working and then uh, can retire on half the pension that he or she uh, expected to have without any further re repercussions for the overall economy. If you ask what happened in the early 90s and what happened in 2008, or 20, well, 2007, 2008, that was intermediaries, banks, and it was real estate. Uh, why are intermediaries exposed to these risks? Some of them will tell you, oh, we are not so exposed, because they hide the exposure. And that's the new development relative to earlier crises. The crises of the early 90s arose from parallel exposures to macro shocks. Everybody was engaging in the same kind of maturity transformation. Uh, more recent crises had to do with contagion from hidden exposures to macro shocks. One example would be Thailand in 97. International banks had lent to Thai banks, and since they didn't want to run an exchange rate risk, they had insisted on writing the contracts in dollars. The Thai banks had lent to Thai firms, and since they didn't want to run an exchange rate risk or a mismatch in their balance sheet, the contracts were written in dollars. The baht was devalued, Thai firms earned money in baht and couldn't pay their dollar debt. So the exchange rate risk had simply been transformed into a counterparty credit risk which happened to be correlated with the same fundamental. The Thai banks were in trouble and so the international banks would have been if the Thai banks hadn't been bailed out by the IMF. AIG writing credit default swaps provides wonderful insurance, except if these contracts are correlated and they have 500 billion worth of them outstanding. So for Deutsche Bank, uh, the contract with AIG was, would have been a problem if it hadn't been for the bailout of, uh, by the Fed. Sometimes this is also hidden in fire sales. I'll get to them. So my conjecture is that the real problem that we need to, think, to be thinking about is what macro risks are these guys, guys taking and how are they doing it? And if they're hiding them, the macro shocks are the source of systemic risk. So why? When I got into these issues, I actually started out with a paper on interest rate risk, which came to the conclusion from an efficiency point of view, there's absolutely no reason why uh, banks should engage in maturity transformation. Liquidity can pr be provided even without that. If long-term stuff is funded by issuing bonds, you have a maturity match, and if the bond markets are liquid, you still provide liquidity. Why do we not observe that? The basic proposition I would submit here is because these contracts cannot be properly committed to. What we see is not efficient, even though all contract theorists will tell you contracting leads to efficient outcomes. 
There are maturity rat race effects of the sort studied by Brunner, Meyer, and Oelke, leverage ratchet effect of the sort studied in the paper with uh, Atmati, De Marzo, and Fleider, which recently appeared, where in each case, the intermediary is already being exposed to debt, makes the intermediary more tempted to engage even more in that kind of risk. Excessive risk-taking is a basic characteristic of debt funding, a basic implication of debt funding. So the puzzle is not really why are they doing it, but why are they doing it in macro? My conjecture is because that's where you get risk premium. Something that's diversifiable typically does not earn you premium, does not earn you extra rates of return. Risk premium come from systematic risks, and those are macro risks. And the contagion comes from the hedges that don't work. So what ha happened in the crisis? Well, first, you had subprime lending and securitization, where the securitization was an attempt to eliminate lots of risks, both micro and macro, from the balance sheet of the lenders on those mortgages. That led to the downgrades of AAA rated securities in August 2007, a breakdown of funding for various institutions that held the stuff off their balance sheet, which was followed by a capital squeeze and deleveraging asset price declines right down sometimes breakdowns of interbank markets smoothed by central banks, funding breakdowns at Bear Stearns and then in September 2008 at Lehman Brothers, driven by repo runs on these banks, which had been exposed because they had so much stuff in warehousing that the losses caught up with them. And post Lehman, all hell broke loose. You had contractual dominoes on a money market fund, runs on money market funds, runs by money market funds, enormous asset price declines. So one question, why so much systemic risk? The base losses from subprime probably were not much larger than the base losses in Japan in the 90s. The difference was in global interconnectedness, fragility, and contagion. The interconnectedness through multiple contracts, through asset pricing, and through fair value accounting. Why has all this increased? Because innovations in accounting, fair value accounting, and risk management, including regulation, encourage banks to hedge and in all this hedging, the correlations are neglected. There is a wonderful report to shareholders by UBS from 2008, which makes very clear how the biases entered into the decision making. Improvements in risk allocation, I'm extremely skeptical. So let me provide, try to provide a little bit of order into our thoughts about this mess. And I begin with the observation that we have lots of different contagion mechanisms. The simplest one is contractual interconnectedness exposed. You have a domino effect. If someone goes into default, the creditors are affected. In this case, a money market fund had to write down the value of its shares to below $1. Breaking the buck, as it was called, became a, a pivotal event. a subtler form of contagion. There are lots of people around who anticipate that they con can write a contract with this defaulting institution. Lehman Brothers was a market maker. If you want to engage in those derivative trades and Lehman Brothers disappears, you have to change your risk management strategies. 
reserve primary was a source of funds for the money market. Anyone who counted on the money market had to, uh, w w w was negatively affected when they disappeared. Reserve primary counted on money market investors. Money market investors ran and took their stuff away from reserve primary. So the disappearance of contracts that you had counted on making is a second effect. Information contagion. Reserve primary breaking the buck meant that other money market funds were not safe. The post Lehman run on money market funds did not just affect reserve primary with 60 billion, but in the same week, all major money market funds with a total of 300 billion. Sometimes you may say, well, this is hysteria contagion. Of course, we know that runs can be in equilibrium, just conditioning on sunspots. Hypersensitivity to information is a feature of these strategic interactions. Now, one of the more interesting features of, this, of the Lehman episode is that the key information came from stock prices and the stock market. The stock price declined, including because of short sales, and that induced the repo financiers to look more carefully at Lehman's balance sheet. So there are information externalities across securities. Asset price contagion, fire sales depress asset prices that leads to write downs at banks with similar positions. Now when they write stuff down, their equity is also written down and the ratio between assets and equity gets worse. So may, they may have to engage in fire sales of their own and you get a spiral going. Credit crunch contagion, if one institution becomes defensive, that leads to a reduction in lending, and that may force their borrowers to become defensive as well. So the main point is we have a, an entire zoo of contagion effects, each of which covers a certain aspect of what we think of as contagion systemic interdependence, but they're very different. And in the real world, they get to, com to be combined. Suspicions about Lehman losses in warehousing motivated short sales of shares. That induced a run. The run forced an insolvency. The insolvency caused reserve primary to break the buck. That triggered a run on money market funds. The money market funds not having any funds anymore ran on the banks and interbank funding broke down. Everyone scrambled for cash, tried to sell assets, and you had an implosion of asset prices. Uh, it's important to see that it wasn't just panic. It was a whole set of different causations driving this process. So how do we think about these things as, an, as analysts? We're talking about the multiplicity of effects in a highly nonlinear system which probably has multiple equilibria and in which there's no transparency about the other participants' positions. And these positions are changing all the time. I challenge any uh, DSGE macroeconomist to find a proper calibration to take account of that mess. One message I want to convey is this is not something you can calibrate. This is something you need to think about. The data series are short. The phenomena are non-stationary and hidden correlations play a central role and are changing all the time. They're endogenous and highly contingent. Same message. You think about the fire sale effects, the strength of a fire sale effect depends on the robustness and financial capacity of potential purchasers. The information that the potential purchasers have and the fear of lemon problems. Expectations about whether we might be in a downward bubble. 
Market illiquidity is highly endogenous and can arise all of a sudden. And that has a huge effect on the implications of a fire sale. So let me uh, give an example of how I came across some of these things. When I was doing research on interest rate risk, I had talked about this with the banker, Swiss Bank Corporation, and his response was, oh, we are not running any interest rate risk. We use asset and liability management for maturity matching. Well, almost. At that time, they used money markets. Later, they used swaps. So I asked myself, why are these people fooling themselves? I knew that this risk mattered. So I came up with the following example, 480 institutions. Each institution, well, institution I borrows at maturity of I minus one month and lends at maturity I months. Maturity mismatch at any one institution is one month. System maturity mismatch, 40 years. We know that if you transform demand deposits into 40-year fixed rate mortgages, you're running interest rate risk. None of these guys notices that. Where is it? It's in the correlations between the counterparty credit risks and the underlying. How can you measure that? Well, you can't. You don't know it. Is this surreal? Think about the transaction chain from an investor to a money market fund to a structured investment vehicle uh, that holds uh, CDOs issued by, another, uh, by, by a special purpose vehicle uh, that constructs the CDOs from putting together asset-backed securities issued by another special purpose vehicle uh, and constructs the asset-backed securities from mortgages obtained from a mortgage bank. The funds go to the mortgage borrower and end up with real estate. It's not 480, but it's still long enough to make any one of the participants incapable of, uh, of assessing what the risk position, the systemic risk position really is. And there have been delusions about the maturity transformation, about the liquidity risks, about credit risks. One of my favorite quotes here, Gary Gorton, subprime mortgage lending funded by mortgage-backed securities held by SPVs uh, and banks involved no maturity transformation because the subprime mortgage was effectively a short-term security. The contract was designed in such a way that the mortgage is bound to be renegotiated after two years. Well, the problem is the house that was funded with the mortgage doesn't have services that adjust upward when the Fed raises the interest rate. So if the quality of the living in the house is the same. And even though the bank may try to renegotiate the rate upward, the borrower may just say, I can't pay, I don't want to pay, here's the key. So what's missing there is the general equilibrium approach to the entire funding relation, the focus on one particular contract uh, makes uh, Gordon missed a significant part of the risks. In the late 80s, there was a, the story of adjustable rates inducing high default risk. I don't want to go there. I want to uh, conclude with some remarks of where should we go and what are we actually doing. First point. Don't use models to think about the real world. Use models to think about the logic of arguments. Models are not theories. Do things in terms of general equilibrium and look at the entire system of transactions and positions 
taking account of the multiplicity of contractual relations and possible correlations, and taking account of the lack of data. I've been active in competition policy for a number of years, and in that area, one knows that there is no one model that you can calibrate to be adequate in all situations, that one needs to improvise with respect to the models, the combinations of models that you try to use to understand what might be going on. And when I say that you try to use, I mean, whose logic you might try to set to work in order to understand what is going on. With some interplay between trying out models and collecting and assessing data without any robustness in moving from one case to the other. The key question in competition cases is always, what's the story? So my suggestion for doing systemic risk analysis would be, forget about the cycle, forget about macro. Just ask the question, what's the story? In terms of the real economy, in terms of financial assets, and in terms of real assets. We know that these guys like to take macro risks because that's where they make money. If they, if, if they are not visible, the question is where do they hide them this time around? So if the constant is they earn risk premium on interest rate risk, on exchange rate risk, and the like. The stuff that varies from cycle to cycle is how they package it. Sometimes they don't even disguise it. Sometimes. Uh, they hide it one way, sometimes they hide it another way. And the problem for the analyst is to figure out where are they hiding it this time. And my institutional proposal for something like the uh, European Systemic Risk Board would be have such an institution with proper resources, which the ESRB doesn't have, provide independent analysis on what's the story without ticking boxes in a long list of things to tick off, without being encumbered by the prejudices of the microprudential supervisors, the central bankers, the finance ministers, and their interests. Separate that from policy analysis, from policy choices. The policy choices will have to involve those who carry them out, and much of macro proof policy is actually micro. So there you have the central bankers, the supervisors, and the finance ministers, and they should get together on how they are doing this. But the, trying to understand what is really going on should be separate and should be independent, and we should ask the question, what's the story? I'll stop there. Thanks a lot.